All righty, folks. We are live here for another amazing evening of Bird Dog Chat with Ethan and Cat. I hope everybody can hear us okay, except for me, who needs to turn his volume down. Turn the volume down. We are streaming for y'all on Facebook as well as on the YouTubes. We still have not quite figured out how to get Instagram to stream live and have good audio because yeah. as far as we have found, there are not any great external microphones that can be used with Instagram Live. We've tried AirPods. We've tried hooking it up through the road. We've tried Bluetooth. multiple options, and none of them work right. So, just As we are... Checking in. Checking in. Let's do some check-ins with folks. Um, I enjoy doing that. Um, Kat was just mentioning, I was mentioned, I feel the same way. I wasn't mentioning, you mentioned it. I felt the same way. We missed doing this last week. We yeah. enjoy coming and chatting with y'all, and we're excited to be here this evening. We've got South Central Indiana. Hello from Pennsylvania, Southern California, Atlanta, Georgia. Sitting by the fireplace in chilly Colorado. Well, it is definitely not chilly here. It's 84 degrees right now. Uh, New York in the house, New Jersey, St. Louis, Wisconsin, Arizona, uh, Las Lunas, New Mexico, home of the 2022 Navda Invitational. We will be talking about that a little bit later. Hey, Angelo. Uh, Arkansas, Utah, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, uh, Idaho, Iowa, Chad. Arizona, Idaho, Oklahoma, West Virginia, Northern Jersey, Northeast Washington, Northern California, Northern Minnesota, Idaho, Red Lodge, Montana, Loveland, Colorado, the UP of Michigan, uh, not to be confused with the mitten. <laughs> Hello, Dry Dork, Dry Dork, Virginia? Dry Dork? Or do you mean Dry Fork? I don't know. Washington, Wet Havenlock, spoon. Ontario, Kansas, Wis oh, we got a Kansan, finally, finally, other than us, Wisconsin, South Carolina, Omaha, Nebraska, Dry Fork, Virginia, hey, that's what I might have thought, uh, Minnesota, Ohio, um, New Hampshire, North Carolina, Northern Florida, Olathe, Kansas, another Kansan, hey, yo, awesome, let's see where our Facebook friends are from. We got some people checking in on Facebook. It's uh, Michigan here, and it says Terry is watching. Um, do you sell Standing Stone kennel merchandise? We do at StandingStoneSupply.com. This is kind of a fun one. We take for granted a little bit that people understand we do have a supply store, but not everybody knows. StandingStoneSupply.com is where you can find everything that we use and recommend for dog training. We don't have the fluff. We have what we actively use and recommend. So there are some changes as we find better things. Things will come and go a little bit. but um, And we're always looking for new things to test out to be able to recommend to folks. But we have another Ohio. We have Dallas. North Central Illinois. Another Iowa. Is that what that says? Yeah. Another Iowa. Come on now. I think we're going to have to like look for the setting on your phone that the font Old is man. bigger. Old man setting. <laughs> uh, Ontario, Canada, Western New Hampshire. Um, hello from Minnesota. Melanie Carlson, hello. We've got uh, Prattville, Alabama. Hi from Northern Illinois, Wisconsin, Eastern Minnesota, Utah. I don't think that Utah people sound like that, but it sounded fun to say it. And many more. Thanks, everybody, for checking in. Yeah, and if you are new to our live streams and the Bird Dog Chat and Bird Dog Bingo, you may want to know how you get your Bird Dog Bingo card. And we're going to talk about that a couple times so that if you're just tuning in, you know how you can go get your bingo card and play along. Uh, so you can get your bingo card on patreon.com slash standingstonekennels. There's a link, and then you can download your bingo card and then as we're going along and doing silly little things that we oh, do shoot, yeah. uh, you can actually um, play along the bingo game uh, one of our patrons actually created um, the first few cards and we've added to some of the options uh, 
of just quirky little things that we do throughout the night, and you can click along as you go. And I'm sure we're going to have to add new things here and there. But tonight, if you are playing Bird Dog Bingo, the first person with a bingo card gets to win a DT Systems Bark Boss. This is a bark collar that is rechargeable, which is really awesome. And people ask us all the time about what do we use for corrective barking? Well, we can utilize a couple different things from redirecting focus, making sure the dog's getting plenty of mental stimulation and physical exercise. But if you've got a dog that is persistently barking about specific things, having a bark collar that senses the vibrations of the bark, that has perfect timing of the correction is highly valuable. So we're we'll be giving one of these away today. Whoever wins, bingo first. So Now, speaking of patreon.com slash standing stone kennels or our Patreon page, it is essentially a different social platform. Okay, so you understand how Facebook or Instagram works where you have a wall as well as some private message or direct message categories. Um, Patreon would be the same, but it's designed as a subscription service. And the way that we set ours up is you have a couple different tiers. One, you have the buy us a beer on podcast night tier, which is $5 a month. And that gets you access to play the game. It also gets you access to the additional content that we do put out on there ahead of time or bonus content on occasion, some extra perks. People find out about special deals that we have on standingstonesupply.com first. You get access to the things when there's limited quantities. So it is a little bit of a private club. Then you move up the tiers, and that's help from the pros, step-by-step -step training, or step-by-step uh, training max, maybe. What is it called? The live last and live No, no, max. no. It's step-by-step -step training program. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's the last tier there. But... What we have there is set up to provide to you guys the most powerful tool that we can for anybody that's trying to train their dogs themselves, and that's us answering your questions and guiding you along the way. Now, the couple different tiers break that out into you need a little bit of help, you got a question on occasion, maybe send an occasional video to, to be looked at and reviewed. The others are going to be, like explained in the title, step-by-step -step program. You're getting a new puppy, you have an older dog, you're ready to kind of work through a specific path headed toward a specific goal, but you don't know all of the pieces in the middle. We set this up where you work with a uh, cat or I, and um, I'll give you the step-by-steps as well as we do bi-weekly or at the top tier weekly check-ins with either video chat or a phone call so that we can go over your progress, where you're at, where you need to go, and any of the hiccups that you seem to be having along the way. That even includes setting up a video consult, basically, where you're watching a training session as it happens and saying, hey, stop what you're doing right there, or your timing's just a little bit off, you need to make an adjustment so that we're not allowing that to happen, you know, throughout multiple videos, things like that. We're able to give you that feedback right away. The craziest part for me about how powerful it actually is. And it happens all the time, especially, you know, like the beginning stuff is important to get right. And having guidance in that is awesome. But we have a ton of videos out that kind of help guide through that too. So there are folks that are, you know, working through that portion of things and doing a good job with it. But when you get into the more advanced stuff, that's where we probably lack a little bit in the video content category. And that's just because we're preaching to a smaller crowd, right? There's less people that are going to the the top tier, but the folks that are need help. And, uh, you know, we've been there, done that a lot of times and can help you. So the, the things that have been interesting to watch along the way are things that are as simple as your timing is off a little bit. You know, like somebody, I saw a video, somebody's working on clicker training and like this clicker training stuff doesn't work. You know, I'm trying to teach my dog to sit. They don't seem to get it. They stand up, they move around, they do whatever, anything but sitting. And I watch it's just video session for me and send it over. And I watch that video and he's literally timing is off enough that the dog sits down. He says, good boy, gives it a treat and then clicks. And it's like, whoa, After whoa, whoa, the whoa, dog's whoa. already sat back up. Uh, yeah, standing back up. back up. So essentially you're marking the dog standing, not sitting, but you're kind of rewarding in the middle. So it's confusing. It's confusing all the way around. And in that one session, watching that one three-minute video clip, we were able to set him down the right path and... 
blew up after that. So it's a very cool way to get help directly from us. And um, not only are you going to get help, but Patreon is the largest supporter of all of the things that we do online. So equipment, um, all of this stuff costs a little bit of money. The additional time that we put into editing videos and shooting videos and putting those things out there, all of that stuff is um, supported by patrons. So you're getting help and you're supporting additional content that you're already enjoying. So, Yeah, and speaking of questions, because I think that's something that a lot of people that are tuning in for the first time or don't really know how the flow of things go, mm -hmm. is we kind of do some updates, talk about a few things, then we have a topic that we like to talk about for a little bit, and then we open it up to questions. So if you're asking questions now, those are questions that we will be trying to get to here towards the end after we've talked for a little bit about something that we think you guys will feel is very interesting. Um, but if you do end up having a question that's just burning a hole in your pocket and you really want it answered, tonight. Um, a super chat is the way to do that. I know that that's able to be done on YouTube. I don't know what the option, if there is an option on Facebook at all, but um, uh, I think there is. We do try and bounce back and get questions on both platforms, uh, but that will be here in a little bit. So, uh, Kind of a fun one. I like this stuff a lot. Sipping on some bourbon tonight. If you are, let's get a little check in with that. I want to see what everybody else has got, but this is the uh, cover your face. Wham. Colonel E.H. Taylor small batch. Tasty stuff. And I threw a couple ice cubes in tonight just for kicks and giggles. Now, um, one thing that's kind of cool that just dropped today that if you didn't know already, we've started a separate channel uh, called Standing Stone Podcast. And we are recording podcasts with different professionals as well as um, our team itself, Kat and I have some Jesses in here, one of our head trainers. Um, Charles will be in some. He's not with us tonight. We'll talk about why here in a minute. But um, podcasts are fun. We dropped another one tonight. If you go on YouTube, and we'd appreciate it, love it if you do this, in fact, um, to subscribe to that channel. It's Standing Stone Podcast. The branding, right? Uh, you can jump over there on YouTube. Listen there or watch, which a lot of the, not all, some of the podcasts actually have um, really interesting and insightful pieces uh, that require that video are helpful to watch um, instead of yeah. just trying to listen and think about how you're following along. The one specifically that we put out today with um, Ben from Onyx is a bunch of screen captures and maps and stuff showing how to use Onyx maps do different filters, look at the topography. Um, I listened to it um, because Ethan did the recording with Ben. I listened to it today and did all the chapters and description and things like that. And I was like, wow, I learned a ton. Not only did I learn a ton about Onyx and how it works, but um, I have heavily relied on Ethan to pick hunting spots for us uh, because he is very familiar with where we go hunting a lot of times. But it was really wow. cool because they broke it down on what you should be looking for when you're looking at good hunting uh, um, properties and not only things like, oh, well, this specifically would be a really good place to hunt, but what other good places to hunt are near there if you're going on a road trip, you know, halfway across the country. You don't want just one good spot if you're going to be there for a week. You want to kind of research and plan out your potential spots and mark them with waypoints and all the really cool stuff. I won't give too much more of it away because I really think you should watch this episode. It, I learned a lot. I thought it was a really great um, episode for people that are learning to hunt, how to use Onyx, things like that, and how to go about planning a hunt. I've used Onyx for years, and I learned a ton. And part of it is they've added a bunch of new features more recently-ish, but um, it's awesome. It's a very, very cool podcast. Definitely check it out. We're also on all the podcasters. If you just have the ability to listen, you can go listen. But then the video portions, if you ever feel like, man, I really feel like I should be watching something here, YouTube, Standing Stone Podcast, they're there. Yes. So if you're just tuning in, remember, you can get your bingo cards on patreon.com slash standingstonekennels. So if you're following along now and you just tuned in, we are playing bird dog bingo, which means there are fun little things on your bingo card talking about what we're drinking tonight and this, that, and the other thing, hunting stuff. So marking your bingo cards as you go so that you can win a... Yeah, first bingo. Bark boss. Gets a bark boss, baby. 
All right. So we talked a little bit about why Charles, well, we mentioned that Charles isn't here tonight helping us out because he's been helping us with these lives on Wednesday night quite a bit, um, helping organize things, pop things up on the screen, just get things flowing really well. And he's not here because... He's in New Mexico. Yeah, at the invite for the Navda Invitational. Um, Angelo had also hinted at that's where he's at, which he's also running a dog. Um, so if anybody's tuning in tonight that is actually running a dog at the Invitational, put that in the comments. Uh, definitely good luck. The Navda Invitational is a huge accomplishment just being able to go and the prep work and training and commitment that you have put into your dog's time and training expense to get there is is phenomenal and whether you walk away with a vc or not uh it, it's a hell of an accomplishment oh absolutely um but if you ain't first you're last so <laughs> bring home the bring home the title but bring dog, home the bacon baby he's, he's running mako the land shark mako is a timber Wah, wah, wah. Timber Dez, right? Mm -hmm. As right? far as I know. As far as I know. For sure it's Timber Puppy. Timber is a shooter snap puppy. Um, and uh, which was a really good breeding. Had a lot of versatility, a lot of bird dog, and you see a lot of that in Mako. So which not that's to a jinx a anything. But repeat breeding that they did again, and that's what Lucy is. Right, right. Ray's dog. Mm -hmm. So Aye. Ray and Emily's dog. Okay, guys, what else? Oh, so we wanted to talk about the invitation a little bit and wish everyone good luck and mention that that's where Charles is at and probably quite a few other people. Um, but that leads us into our topic of discussion tonight is how do you get there? So Navda has a system of tests. Yes, Timber does. Getting random approval approvals from other people here. Jeremy, <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy, Jeremy. <laughs> says, yes, Timber does. Been watching that stuff close. Um, so we wanted to talk about the Navda testing system a little bit and break that down. Uh, there is a ton to learn about the different testing systems. Um, Navda specifically has the natural ability test, the utility preparatory test, the utility test, and then the invitational. Uh, so Tonight, we wanted to break down just the bare bones a little bit about each of those tests. Like I said, it is a lot of information to throw at you, so going to just go over some of the basics. If you guys want to know more, I highly recommend you get your Ames Program Test Rules book from Navda yeah. and read it. Um, don't just set it on your shelf somewhere. This has good information that's going to prepare you for the test. Um, for, for whatever level you're testing at. And then I can't stress enough, if you are planning on running, no matter whether it's the natural ability test or the utility test or the invitational, if you're going to go to one of those tests, going to one prior to you running is amazing. You can watch a lot of the tests. You can follow along in the field if the handler and the judges approve that, which most of them are okay with, um, so that you can get a picture and a see actually with your eyes what they're talking about in this book. Uh, like Ethan and I mentioned, what Patreon is what? really beneficial for Somebody is... Somebody says bingo already? What? Well, we'll have to verify. Verification <laughs> happening. Um, Continue. So, where was I at? Sorry. Um, oh, so like on Patreon, well, yeah, like on Patreon, you know... Typing up a question is great, but getting to see a video of what's actually going on in your training session and us being able to go, ah, that's what's happening here is so, so much more amazing. So if you can go to a test and watch other dogs run in the field, other dogs do the water portions of the test, it's going to put what you read in the book to practice in the field and visually, um, and it's going to be really beneficial. And then also highly recommend going to an Ames and Rules clinic uh, where they break down the scoring and what they're looking for, what the judges are looking for. They used to call it a handler's clinic, and it's really not um, teaching you how to handle your dog properly, but teaching you what the dogs um, should be doing in the field, how they're being judged, how they're being scored, and how to use a scorecard. Did we get a bingo? I don't see that card number. Do, do, do. Yeah, quick, quick look. See, says I don't. I searched it. I don't even see. Unless I'm an idiot, but I mean, <coughs> I mean, I'm not saying, but I'm saying. <coughs> I'm 
Is there is there is there a second page or something? Uh no. Okay. <coughs> There's a couple that are close ish. But I don't even see that that, that card, card number. I'm uh-uh. looking. Was it this one? I know it's always a five. Mm mm. Says Sorry, pause for pause for pause. looking at this really quick. I got it. I mean, there's a little like none oh of these. Oh my gosh, that's quite here. a few cards tonight. There are two pages. It's not definitely not, not on the second on page. Not on the second page Kay. either. Anyway, so Bro, want to break down the test into the the different levels of testing. So the natural ability test is the for lack of a better word, puppy test, uh, because it is a test that has to be run before a dog turns 16 months old. Now, there is no <coughs> minimum uh, for puppies running this test, but the puppies have to be able to do parts of this test, which um, include field portion, water portion, a tracking portion, and then also we're judging for gun sensitivity and looking at their physical attributes. We're actually judging physical attributes in not only the NA test, but the UPT and the utility level testing. Um, if you've gone through all that testing and you're at the invitational, they are not actually doing um, physical characteristics at that time anymore because um, your dog's already been judged. Because in order to get to the invitational, they have to have at least gotten a prize one in, well, they have had to get a prize one in the utility test, which involves physical attributes being judged. So um, at the natural ability level test, which is, like I mentioned, more of a puppy test, it is judging natural ability. Now, that's not to mean that you're not going to do any prep work or uh, exposure to prepare for this test at all, uh, because your dog does need to have an understanding of what they're out there to do. So the natural ability test has a field portion where the dog has to go out and hunt a field, search the field for 20 minutes. It's hunting, searching like it normally would, and it's supposed to find and point birds. Now, it doesn't have to have any level of steadiness on pointing. So what that means is the puppy goes on point, and as soon as it's aware of the handler, so as soon as you're coming in to flush, we're no longer judging pointing, but we're judging steadiness. And because that's not part of the natural ability test, pointing is now over. So if your puppy points until you're there and then as you're walking into flush, they go and help you flush, that is completely a-okay. If your puppy is out there just running around willy-nilly pushing out birds and not even stopping to point them, that's not what we're looking for. That's called a fun adventure and a donation to the (laughs) test. Flushing dog fiasco. So um, there's that field portion. During the field portion, we're not only judging the puppies pointing, but how they're searching the field. Is it purposeful? Are we finding birds? Are they handling fairly cooperatively? Things like that. Um, we are also judging their use of nose. Are they using their nose to find and point birds? Um, are they being cooperative in the field in a sense that they are hunting, but they are hunting with you as a team? And then also, um, do they have desire to be out there or are they just walking next to you? So there's a lot of parts, um, in the field that we are looking at. Um, there's also a tracking portion of the test where we're actually having the puppy come up and track a wounded pheasant simulation. It's got flight feathers pulled and it's a pheasant that has run off that you're bringing your puppy in to track that way. If you're actually hunting and your puppy comes on a downed bird, but it's run, it has a good chance of recovering and finding that game. So that's what the tracking portion is looking for is a dog that can focus on that track and not just break out and search, but stay focused on it and follow their nose. Do they have to recover the wounded pheasant or the the flightless pheasant? pheasant? No, they absolutely don't. Um, But we do want to see them expanding and searching and being focused on that. Then, um, I don't know if I mentioned this, um, but in the field portion, we're also looking to see if the puppies are gun sensitive. So there's two shots fired, um, just blanks at the beginning of the test. Uh, We're checking to see if the puppy has any gun sensitivity. We aren't actually shooting any birds for the dogs um, in the field, anything like that. There's actually no retrieving being judged in the natural ability test. Uh, And then at the water, we're also just judging that puppy's, you know, ability to swim. We need to see them swim at least twice, uh, going in the water with little to no hesitation, swimming depth. Um, They can't just be wading and splashing around. They have to break over and swim. 
Um, it's four bumpers. You typically throw bumpers out there to entice them into the water, but they don't even have to retrieve the bumper. It doesn't matter. They need to swim and come back to you cooperatively. So those are the things that we are judging. Um, I think Ethan pulled up the um, natural ability yep, scorecard. So you guys can take a look at it. Um, for people that aren't super familiar with the scorecard, it can look really confusing um, and be oh, for sure it is. complicated. Um, that's where one of those rules and aims clinics is going to be super helpful in explaining how this is filled out. But a really brief uh, overview is if you look at the use of nose, let's say. Let's say your puppy does great on the track and great in the field and they get a four in use of nose in both of those places, you would actually pull that score across. Um, so you got a four in track and a four in field. The four would come over and you'd put a little four in that top slashed spot. And then that number six that's next to it is actually your index. So it's multiplying your score times six. So you get 24 points. So if you do that all the way down and you get a maximum score in each of those areas, so four is all the way down times the index point, your maximum score at the natural ability test is 112 points. Now, what are those uh, four, three, three, four, three, two, three, three, two? So those, those, for? those indicate what you have to get in each of those categories to receive a prize one, two, or three. So if your puppy gets a four in use of nose, four in search, four in water, or even a three in water, three or four in pointing, three or four in tracking, four in desire to work, and a three or four in cooperation, you can get a prize one. Now, if in any of those areas your puppy gets the in the middle section a three or a two, then your puppy can only receive a prize two, um, even if it's in just one category. So I know that gets kind of confusing and complicated. Definitely check out a rules and aims clinic if you are interested in learning more. Um, but one thing that I want to mention, um, I know that there are places on the internet, uh, Facebook groups, things like that, where new handlers and people are super excited to share how well their puppies did, especially in the puppy department, because that's typically the first test that you try and run with your puppy when you're getting involved in something like this. And people are like, oh, my puppy got a perfect score, 112 points. And there are those in the outdoor hunting community that are like, oh, your dog isn't perfect. They didn't get a perfect score. Well, to cover CYA, you can say, my dog got a max score. The maximum score your puppy can get in a natural ability test is 112 points. Um, we don't say perfect score typically because, hey, you know, we're looking at the overall picture of the dog, and is there such a thing as a perfect run? You know, maybe your puppy made a mistake here or a little mistake there, but they still did well enough to get a max score, um, but they still may have made a mistake or, or handled not as well as they could have. So that's where it's more of, I got a max score because there's always um, a little bit of room for improvement. Sure. So the next test that I kind of want to talk about is the UPT test. All right, that's and that is on page 27. And we're just uh, pulling up these uh, scorecards from the uh, test rules and aims program rule book. Lots of information here, folks. A lot more going on when you get to the UPT or the utility level testing. Um, we're judging a lot more of not just your puppy, but things that involve teamwork and obedience from um, a cooperation handling standpoint between the dog and the handler. So all of these areas, we're looking at different things. So I'm just going to run down the scorecard and kind of briefly describe and explain what we're looking at. So um, in the UPT test, there is a portion where they are searching for a duck. We're utilizing a marshy area and the duck is actually dead in the UPT test. And the dog has to go out, search, and um, ideally find the duck and recover it. Does not have to find the duck and recover it to receive a score for the UPT or the utility test. We just want to see a constant expansion of that search and make sure that they are um, out there actively searching and actively searching new cover. Then, um, just going down, we're doing walking at heel. If you look at the, so I want to mention on the scorecard, yeah. if That's you see I on search for duck, it. there is categories that we're judging in that. So we're looking at nose, desire, cooperation, and obedience. So those are all things that we consider when giving an overall score for search of duck. 
at walking at heel, the only thing we're considering is obedience because that's all that walking at heel involves. Uh, that's why they're blacked out there. Yep, so you don't put a okay. score there. Same with um, any of the other places that you see a dark gray or blacked out square. We're not actually judging in that category for those specific things. Now, is that grid, uh, you know, what what is the portion of the the grid being there? So we're looking at grid spaces being tertiary scores and then the horizontal lines on some of these as secondary and then the open spaces as primary scores. Um, so those are areas where you would weigh more heavily the primary scores. Um, and it's not an mm -hmm. exact mathematical equation. There's a lot that goes into how you determine your overall score for those areas. Um, but you would say, hey, for the steadiness by the blind, I'm going to be weighing more heavily my obedience score in that portion than my cooperation score that I'm giving that dog in that portion. Looks like a heck of a lot of obedience in the whole test. Yes, and that is definitely what we're looking at when we get into these higher levels of testing because there is a ton of obedience expected when you get into these um, more advanced processes of steadiness and retrieving to hand um, and not only hunting for themselves but hunting for, for you in, in these areas. So uh, walking at heel, they've got to walk um, – at heel next to you for approximately 25 yards. Um, it is not through a healing course or stakes or anything like that at the UPT test. Then there's a steadiness by the blind portion where your dog is sitting next to you at a blind at the water. There's a duck, a dead duck, launched out into the water. You swing on the duck, pretend to shoot it with a blank, and then you send your dog for the retrieve. So if your dog stays steady next to you through that sequence, that's what we're scoring here. Then the next portion is the actual retrieve of the duck that was just thrown out into the water. Um, as you can see, there's, again, all four categories that we're judging for the retrieve of duck portion. The search is our field search that we're looking at, and you're spending 25 minutes in the field as UPT dog. Then we're lo also looking at pointing um, when you're in the field. And then the steadiness sequences. So steadiness at the UPT level testing is um, we're only looking at the steadiness to wing. So basically, during the flushing sequence, your dog has to stay steady. Once that bird takes wing, and as it's shot, we're also judging that portion. Once the shot goes off, your dog is A-OK -okay to go make the retrieve or to break if the shot uh, um, was a safety or the bird doesn't get, doesn't get killed. So this is an interesting thing for me. A um, little bit of, uh, but that's similar to the level of steadiness for senior hunter, mm -hmm. right? They can break when the shot goes off. Boom, dog's free to go, Correct. right? Yep. Um, it's interesting because this is definitely a middle ground from a steadiness standpoint, right? Uh, if you're prepping to be steady to all of it, a lot of times dogs are going to be most likely to break at the gunfire category or the fall of the bird. Like they see the bird coming down, that's when they want to go. Right? And, and that's because we have prey-driven animals. Yeah, absolutely. And they want to make those retrieves. So they know that the retrieve happens when the shot happens and the bird goes down. So all those things become more exciting, more anticipatory because the dog is like, the shot happens, the retrieve happens. That's when, when the excitement, the go time happens. Now, the interesting thing for me from a training standpoint and an observation standpoint of what happens to dogs in that level is I've personally found if you are training to that level, it's more difficult to maintain than training for the level above and then maybe handling to that level. So um, it can end up being it can end up making the testing category to move beyond that more difficult because they get used to in that environment where there are no e-collars, there are no true abilities to handle or reprimand, and dogs become test smart-ish a little bit to that category. So um, though it is the standard, it's always better to train to slightly above the standard before you're going to the test. That's a the only thing that I would say with that. So continue on. It's just Yeah, and I think that it's important to to mention why sometimes it's harder to maintain the level of steadiness to shot or I guess we call it steady to shot when we're training or when we're running through AKC, but on the UPT level, it's considered steady to wing. Um, so basically, the dog has to be steady until the shot happens. And then once the shot happens, they're able to break. And the reason is, what are you doing when you are shooting a bird? 
you're watching the bird typically. It's really mm-hmm. hard to be watching the bird mm-hmm. and the dog, unless you've got eyes in the back of your head and you're a mom, but still it's difficult. And dogs start to anticipate as soon as that gun comes up, one, two, boom, that's when the shot happens, and I'm going. And then you bring the gun up, and it's normally one, two, boom, and now they're breaking at one. And then you don't realize they're breaking at one because you were expecting them to break at shot, and then they're going, and you're like, well, did they break before the shot, or did they break at the shot? Like, when did that happen? And if you're training by yourself, it's really difficult. So that's why we say it's harder to train to that level because it's unclear sometimes when that dog is actually breaking and that anticipation can really happen. Whereas when you're testing for the higher levels like the UPT, which involves more steadiness where they're actually steady to fall, they are steady until the bird hits the ground and you send them to make the retrieve. Do we we have a legit bingo now? No, I have clarification and I want to throw this out here. Uh, Robert St. Jean, I got your screenshot and I appreciate it. Um, We have uh, cat rolls eyes at Ethan. That's pretty much happens all the time. time. So, (laughs) If you haven't checked that box, go ahead and do it. Then we have a single barrel bourbon. I'm sorry, but this is actually a small batch. Um, And I can show that off up here again. I don't know if it'll come through. I I don't know anything about bourbon, so I would have made that mistake too. Sorry. The free square, you definitely got that one. And uh, we mentioned Super Chat 100% and Novice. So you are just missing, in that category, not actually a bingo. Unfortunately, small batch versus single barrel. And I'm really bad about um bourbon stuff still so um moving i don't i was at steady was i at steadiness where was i at we were talking um in the the steadiness portion yes okay so we were talking about oh you you asked a bunch of obedience so um i think i was talking about search so you're in the field searching for 25 minutes hunting um like you normally would covering ground and then pointing again like i mentioned before in the natural ability test pointing ends when the dog is aware of the handler Hold up one second. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, I wanted to mention there's a couple questions coming yeah, for through. Yeah, sure. Just so that people know, we will we will answer questions if we co- as we come through to the end of this, which will be, um, we'll s- we'll spend 20, 30 minutes hopefully answering questions for folks. Um, again, super chats are going to be answered first. If you have, you know, just one burning a hole in your pocket, roll with that. But then um, we'll roll back through these at the end. So definitely keep the questions coming, and we will try and get to as many as we can. Um, so pointing ends when the dog is aware of the presence of the handler. And then that's when the steadiness and that's all obedience. So if you, um, yeah, there's a, there was a picture in here that shows this, the sequence. Yeah. It's no, went the wrong way. Sorry. It's the, it's very similar. It's in the utility portion. Sorry. There. Right here it is. Boom. So pointing happens here. Then once the dog's aware of the presence of the handler, you're coming into flush. That's when we're doing our steady to flush portion. And that's when pointing ends. And now all we're judging is steadiness. Through that steady to flush, that's when the bird's still on the ground and you're kicking around and you're looking for it. That's a lot for a dog to handle, um, especially if a bird is running around in front of the dog and not quite taking wing. Um, Then you've got steady to wing where the bird takes flight, but you haven't shot yet. Then steady to shot is when you've shot the bird and it's going to hit the ground. Once it's hit the ground, then we're judging steady to fall, where the dog isn't just breaking the second that that bird hits the ground. They're actually waiting for a command, a cue, a release to go make that retrieve. Mm -hmm. Can you, um, at that point, I don't know, I have nothing. Okay. Um, So UPT, we're judging steady to wing. UT. We're judging steady to fall. Also at the invitational level, it's steady to fall. So steady to wing meaning, boom, the shot happens right here, right? And then there's no judgment in this category. Yep. Once the shot happens and the bird is coasting to the ground, the bird, the dog can break. You're free to go, but you're welcome to stay. Yeah. So let's go back to page 27. 27. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can just type it there. Handy dandy. Boom, baby. (laughs) Um, so then, like I said, steadiness sequence is typically primarily being judged on obedience. Um, and then the retrieve is very important. Um, so we're looking for a very finished, polished retrieve, no drive-bys, no snatch and grabs as your dog comes close. Oh, well, we're talking about UPT. Excuse me. Sorry. 
got ahead of myself. So UPT, um, the dog needs to go out, pick up the bird, and bring it back um, within about a step. So it doesn't have to be to hand um, to receive full score on that. We've got um, the retrieve by drag, which is actually a duck that is dragged off, um, I think it's about 50 yards. I can double check in the book, but um, drug off 50 yards, the dog is sent to retrieve that duck. It has to come back with the duck. Um, now, if you look, retrieve by drag is a lot of obedience as well, and no nose work. So you're not judging nose at all on retrieve by drag because there is such a scent highway when you're dragging a duck. If a dog can't follow that smell, its nose is absolutely broken. Um, so they have to go out. Yeah, out not nose is broken, but they're <laughs> just not paying attention, right? Or, I mean, or they haven't had enough opportunities to figure out how to use their nose in a drag scenario. So um, we're... Because it requires a little bit of focus. A lot of bit of focus, for sure. Well, requires focus. And it requires less nose than it requires focus and uh, obedience to complete the task, basically, yeah. right? And Cooperation, whatever. Yep, and so the... D- Dog picks up the duck and has to, again, retrieve within a step to, to the handler. Mm, there's some good questions coming in about oh this that we'll be able to I bet to. there will be. Um, so then if you look at all of these parts of the UPT test, then you look at the bottom, and you've got nose, desire to work, cooperation, and obedience. And those are things that are being judged throughout the entire test, right? So then you take your scores from all the way from search for duck all the way down through retrieve by drag, which again, any of those places there's blanks, we're not considering those for nose. And we're getting, for lack of a better word, an average score. It is not a mathematical equation exactly, um, but we're looking at the overall picture of what that dog did today. Was there any issues that the dog had and was it related to their nose or was it more related to desire to work, cooperation or obedience? And we want these scores to depict that for us. So if I, as a judge, or I, as a handler, or as a breeder, am looking at the scores that are in the Nobda database, I can look at their overall scores in all of these areas, and I can get a pretty good picture of actually what happened that day just by the numbers on the paper. But you bring those scores down, and all of those scores get filled in here, brought across over, just like everything, multiply by these indexes, and again, same thing, three, two, two, all the way through the top. These are going to be your prize one categories that they have to get a minimum of that score in each of these, um, prize two and prize one categories. The maximum score you can get at a UPT test is 184 points. Um, and then if you look here for the steady to flush and steady to wing, this is something that I just wanted to hit on. See how these boxes are blanked out? It's because we're taking the overall steadiness score of all of the sequences. So if your dog finds four birds, five birds, we're taking every single sequence into consideration um, when we're giving them an overall steadiness score, and then that's coming across here. Um, we're not giving them an actual score for each of the portions of the steadiness sequence. Okay, so that's UPT, kind of in a nutshell again. Um, then now let's talk about the yeah. Let's just talk about the main differences between the two because yep. they're similar. They're, they're very similar. similar. Yeah, the big differences are we are also judging all Sorry. the way across the board. A new thing here called stamina, all the way down. There's a lot of places that stamina isn't a consideration. Um, walking at heel, we're not judging stamina. Um, <laughs> remaining by blind, we're not judging stamina. But Can you walk 10 yards, <laughs> yeah, fat man? Exactly. So um, in the utility test, we are using a live duck for the search for duck. But again, the dog doesn't have to recover the duck to get a max score, a qualifying score um, for a prize one. Now, if it does find the duck, it does have to retrieve that duck. It can't just leave it out in the marsh. Um, It needs to bring it to hand, as well as at the UPT level. If it finds the duck, it's got to bring it back, um, at least within that step. So differences at walking at heel, we're actually walking through a healing course. So there's stakes set out, um, healing stakes to walk through. The remain by blind um, is actually uh, different because there is no remain by blind in the UPT. So in the utility test, you're actually setting your dog inside or outside the blind, right by the blind, and you're leaving the dog. You're going out of sight of the dog and shooting 
a distraction shot, then waiting a few seconds to see what your dog is going to do. A few seconds, 10 to be exact. Um, that's what you're supposed to be doing. And then shooting again. And your dog needs to remain by the blind without carrying on and being noisy, without leaving the blind to look for you or excessive movement. Then you come back to the blind and that's when we're actually doing the steady by blind sequence. And again, that's quite different than the study by blind for the UPT test. Um, your dog is placed outside of the blind and there should be separation between you and your dog. Then there is a distraction gunner, yourself, and then a duck being thrown. So the sequence would go, you get your dog placed and everything's ready, and then you have your distraction shot, you shoot. The distraction shot again, the duck comes out, you swing and shoot on the duck, as soon as the duck hits the water, you need to make sure that your dog is actually being steady, and then you send it for the retrieve. And that is the steady by blind sequence. Then, again, we're judging the retrieve of duck, just like we were at UPT, except all of these retrieves in the utility level testing have to be to hand. So that is the steady by blind, remain by blind sequence. Then we've got the search, which is the field search, and that is 30 minutes, so a little bit more time in the field. Um, pointing, again, same thing as the UPT level testing. Steadiness, now instead of just steady to flush and steady to wing, we're also judging the steady to shot and steady to fall parts, which we showed in that diagram again, um, right there. So we're judging this back half, the steady to shot and steady to fall. Now, you can release your dog remotely, but they need to be released and it needs to be hey, there is a pause between that bird hitting the ground and you sending them. So you don't have to necessarily return to your dog's side before sending them. Um, then what's the next portion here? Um, we've got the retrieve of the shot bird. That's also part of the utility test, again, to hand. And then we've got the retrieve by drag, which is a longer drag, um, one to 200 yards instead of the 50 yards for the UPT test. Um, in that portion, which um, I wanted to mention, is the dog actually goes out of sight of the handler during the retrieve by drag, and there is a judge watching what does that dog do at the end of the drag. Does the dog go out and immediately just pick up that duck, turn around, and book it back to their owner, their handler, or does that dog mess with the bird? Does it try and bury it? Does it pee it? Does it chew it? Does it leave it? What is it doing out of sight of the handler with that game? So that's can part you, of the test. Can you imagine just wandering along on your trail, sniffing out your duck, and then you spot some guy or gal standing behind a tree watching you? And, of course, we're trying <laughs> to be unobtrusive and not startle the dog, but we do need to see what's going on, and the dog should be focused enough to complete their task, uh -huh. even if they spot a judge in oh, the field. Oh, 100%. So. <laughs> I know. Um, and then, again, we're taking all of those scores down, 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 doing nose, desire, stamina, cooperation, obedience, and coming across with all of those. Um, and your max score at a utility level test is 204 points. Big things here that are important are you got to search for duck. Okay, that's a uh, You got to get a, a four. Uh, it's a big one. It's a difficult portion. It's a difficult portion to understand from a judging standpoint exactly what they're looking for. There's a lot of arbitrary information passed around like you have to do some magic 10 minutes or blah 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 there's a lot more to it than that but um that's where the aims and rules clinic that you can go to it's gonna make that a lot clearer on what are you actually looking for what are they actually judging um the rest of it's fairly straightforward um uh, i would say mm, I don't really think that there's any other categories that really just get hammered with confusion. Doc search is one of them, though. Yes, like yeah. I would, I would agree with you on that. And then um, the thing about the utility test is, if you get a prize one at the utility test, whether it's a max score or not, mm. you. Miss Kelly said, "Cat, come to New Jersey, Delaware Valley chapter to judge. We do two tests a year, <laughs> and I've heard that uh, Miss Kelly does her barbecue stuff and." I well sounds amazing. Have have your test secretary send me an invite, and I will check my calendar. And sooner rather than later. Sooner rather than later. Weekends fill up fast around here between judging, running our own dogs, testing, uh, puppies, litters, 
all that good stuff. So, um, and then, oh, I was saying, so if you get a prize one, no matter a max score, whatever the score, prize one, you can be invited to the Invitational, which is what is going on in New Mexico right now. It's the first time it's been held in New Mexico. It has been going back and forth between um, Iowa and Ohio for the last quite a few years. Um, and so this is really great opportunity. I wanted to show that picture. This is gorgeous. So Charles and Annie are down there right now and they sent this. How do I get rid of me? I want you to go away for a minute. Cover your face. Is it, is it, I can't tell if it's going. Ah, it's yeah. It's gorgeous. Just it's gorgeous there. There's, there. I'm sure there's going to be so many pictures and videos flooding the social medias um, of this amazing opportunity for people down there. So um, once you get to the Invitational, you're looking at a lot more. Oh, that's so smart. You can do that, too. Uh, it, you, you, you can't see it yet, folks. Kat's oh. really excited because she can see it, but nobody else can. <laughs> Who knew? Uh. Ethan's, Ethan's doing his technological stuff to make it happen, so you guys get to see this cool picture. I'm going to try. He's going to try. He's going to try his best. Whoop, don't do that. Sorry. Ah, are we still going? Yep. Okay. Um, so briefly, I'm not going to get into a ton of details on the invite, um, but there is a field portion and a water portion um, being judged. The field, the big, 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 big difference is you are running not only for – uh, 60 minutes, which is an hour, people. That's a long time for a dog to be out there under judgment. Um, but you are running with a brace mate for that amount of time, which means you have another dog out there pointing birds that you have to back, or your dog has to back. Retrieving birds <laughs> that your dog... <laughs> yeah, well, that works. Well, it kind of works. Yeah, All right, you get the gist You get the gist. Gorgeous. This Gorgeous. is where the honoring sequences at the Invitational this year, I believe, is what they texted us. Um, yep. So... Pretty, pretty, pretty. Boom. Um, so the brace work is a big difference, right? You're running with another dog out there, and there's backing involved. Then the water portions of the test, um, there is the double mark where they actually have you heel up to your position. You get your dog placed. Um, there are two marks. One is thrown. A duck is thrown um, about 50 yards out, and a second duck is thrown about 20 yards out, and you are shooting as each of those marks happen. Both of them happen. Then you send your dog to retrieve the second thrown duck. The other duck, your first duck, is considered your memory bird, and your dog has to remember that it's out there. While that dog is out there retrieving that first, well, technically the second duck, but making their first retrieve, there is a distraction shot that happens, kind of pulling the dog's focus to say, hey, other things are happening out here, but you are still going to have to remember there's another duck to retrieve out there. And once you get back there with your first duck, I'm going to send you for the second one, and you need to go make that retrieve. So um, it's a lot of concentration for a dog. It is. Definitely. Absolutely. And a lot to focus through. And then they're healing to and from the double mark. Um, there is the blind, which is literally what it sounds like. There is a duck out there on the opposite bank, a minimum of 100 yards from you. You hear your dog down to the water. There's no shots. There's no marks. Your dog just needs to trust you that you're sending them across this open water to find a bird, find a dead duck. And they need to go across the water, come up with the duck, and come back with it. Um, then you typically are healing from that blind portion to the honoring sequence where your dog is placed about 10 feet from another dog that's sitting at the edge of the water. A duck is thrown, a shot is fired, and your dog has to sit steady, quietly, watching the other dog make the retrieve. So quite a few areas of steadiness, quite a few areas of honoring another dog's retrieve, um, and a lot of focus and trust and obedience and cooperation happening um, between handler and dog. So uh, the maximum score you can receive at the Invitational is a 200. Um, there is a scorecard listed in the back of the, um, I think, test rules as well, but um, a lot more complicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah there's multiple so pages. Yeah, and if, y if you go up, so this is where your scores would be written, but, and you have, if you see, it's it's a pass-fail, guys. No one your sees pass that. Fail. Oh, it's nobody's. Yeah, I need to put it back so people can see what's happening. Okay. 
So Which one do you want to look at? The bottom one where you were just Sorry. At. So it's a pass-fail. In these areas, you're getting a score, again, one through four. Um, well, you could get a zero, I suppose. Uh, but that is what that you have to receive. That would be bad. Yep. <laughs> Things happen, though, guys. The Zeros wheels fall off. Zeros are bad. Well, the wheels fall off. You've done all your work. It's a lot of pressure and a lot to put on a dog and a handler in one day, and things happen. But um, Does it change the fact that it's bad? <laughs> no. no. Okay. But um, this is what your dog would have to receive in each of those categories to pass and become a versatile champion. Now, there was one page up here, which, again, I wanted to just show boop, 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 here, um, which is, again, we talked about the minimum qualifying score to get a pass. This is your index number in each of those areas. So getting a 4 times a 5 equals a 20, that sort of thing. So um, there, there you have it, guys. That is all I've got on overview of the NAVDA testing system. You rocked it, babe. <laughs> you rocked it. A lot of information. Highly recommend reading your rules book and going to an Ames and Rules Clinic and going to your chapter training days, mock tests, and even an actual test prior to running. I I know I did not have an opportunity to go to a natural ability test prior to, or no, I got to watch you run Shooter at your first natural ability test, but you did not have Shooter 1. Um, shooter 1. You did not have the opportunity to go to a natural ability test prior to running him. So no, I was totally confused. Totally new. We had we kind of had an idea, um, and then we did have the opportunity to go to um, a utility test and the invitational prior to actually yeah, running dogs folks. at both levels, which was really beneficial. So anyway, that's what I got for that. Let's answer some questions. Yeah, time to roll in the questions. If you've been holding on to one and want to make sure we have the opportunity to see it. And you've stuck around with us Here this whole time since it's been about an hour. Our, yeah, you got to see what our little uh, live stream display screen looks like there. And um, But this is one of the ones that was really interesting that I wanted to kind of start with that I saw. Absolutely. And if I missed something else in there, please let me know. But it says, Illinois Sportsman. I'm having a really hard time with my GSP while on point. He keeps getting happy feet. Any ideas? He does run two collars. A lot of times he does great. Other times he moves his feet. I want to run him in his master hunt test, but I can't take off his collars and get reliable re 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 results. This is a good one. I, you have a lot of stuff to say on this. Oh, all the stuff. First and foremost, um, happy feet's an interesting problem, okay? It's one that we have in uh, some of our dogs. And it's difficult to work past. It's very difficult to work past. Now, there are some potentials, and this is more theory than anything because it's never truly caused problems to the advanced levels as you're talking about. Because what you are looking at, it, it depends on what you mean by happy feet. So some clarification here would be helpful. But when we see happy feet, it's like this. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. It's and like anticipation it. of excitement. It's anticipation. This is, yeah, anticipation and excitement, but the feet are moving. Da, 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 da. But the distance that the dog actually moves is minimal to non-existent. So explain to me if that's what you're experiencing or if you're actually seeing forward progress. That's the d deciding factor, okay? So watch for that to pop back through. Now, the next thing is you mentioned two collars. If you are still running with a belly collar, you are nowhere near, and I hear brutally honest words, you are nowhere near ready to be entering into a test. Not that you said that you were, but. Brutally uh, honest. Nowhere comment. near, okay? If we still need a belly collar, do not send in your entries. Now, once you can remove the belly collar, move to, you should be running with a belly collar. If you watched any of our video series, you're going to see that we start everything like we start all training, which is with teaching, okay? We utilize pigeons. Learn to stop chasing. That's it. It's very, very minimal correction. We start with easy. Birds come up behind us. You've got dog, me, bird back there. Then you have um, birds are getting more difficult. They're kind of coming out quartered to sideways. Now they're coming at you, but the dog has learned I need to stand. If they have movement involved in this, we utilize Pressure on their abdomen with an e-collar. I 
often referred to as a belly collar, but is a standard e collar applied in the belly region. That's why we refer to it as a belly collar. But it takes very minimal amounts of pressure, and that's the reason why we go to that. It's not used for anything else other than stop and stand still, so it's very clear what you're asking. It's very easy to stop dogs, okay? Now you move past that. We do stand wing, stand shot, meaning the dog's not moving while these things happen. Wing and shot. Then we go stop to wing, stop to shot. And these can happen fairly quickly. These can take a long time depending on the prey drive and desire of the dog. And then once you have those. And I just want to clarify, yep. s- stop to wing, stop to shot. The dog is actually moving when a bird goes and they need to stop. Yep. Dog's running around, shot goes off. Boom. Stop. They need to be stopping to that. So it's essentially birds say, whoa, dog, and, and gunfire says, whoa. Then uh, you move out. You're going to be pointing pigeons and launchers. Somebody's over there sleeping. You see Nixer, if you tuck this way a little bit. Oh, wrong way. Like the mirror. Hello, Nixer, in the corner. And Vex just got up from his dog bed and shook off and walked over there. Hello, Vexer. All right, so um, you get back in the field. Birds are going to be coming out of launchers. Typically, we utilize pigeons. He says, I spy a bed. This a is also a real our bed. Yeah, not a real bed. This is also our, our guest loft area. Loft area. So there's extra beds over here. Um, but you're in the field. You have launchers. Birds are coming out of them. The dogs understand standing wing, standing shot. Should be fairly easy to move through this category. And then once the birds fall out of the sky, it gets very difficult. But through this progression, you should be wearing that belly collar all the time. And then when you feel comfortable with it, moving to making corrections on the neck while still wearing a belly collar. And when you're no longer needing the potential for the belly collar at all, remove it, making corrections only on the neck. Now, these are all of the things that should happen prior to where we are. Did they just switch places? They just switched places. Swappers. Well, he so realized the chair was empty because Nick's came down for snuggles. I like it. So you've got um, all of these things factored in. Now we're making corrections with the e-collar on their deck. The belly collar is gone. Okay? You're getting closer to ready to send those entries in. But you need to move into physical and verbal handling. Verbal coming first, physical coming second. Whoa means something now. And that's all you've got. So you've got to talk mean and dirty. You know, everything has to say some, mean something. There's got to be a lot of inflection and grumpiness there because that's all you've got now, right? We're talking about this. You said you removed the collars and all bets are off. So we have to um, theoretically or not theoretically, what would it be? Figuratively remove the collars from the equation. The e-collar is your last resort. If the dog has completely blown you off, we can stop them still, okay? That's how we get to the we point of... We never run a dog without their e-collar. Except for test day. Except for test day. Mm-hmm. So, like Ethan said, we are figuratively not utilizing the collar to handle the dog anymore. Correct. But it's there as a safety net if you need it so that the dog doesn't learn that the wheels can fall off and I can still get, get away with it. So, um, it's there if you need it, but you better not. Yep. So, and then physical handling is going to be actually grabbing your dog and picking them up and saying, hey, knock it off, set them back down. You don't have to drag them all the way back to a spot or any of those kind of things. It's not so much. I talk about dogs being placed and situationally oriented, but in that case, all that they're understanding is that you were part of the stop me category. Okay. You don't have to drag them however far they move. Just pick them up and say, hey, stop moving. Set them back down. Now, um, collar strap, tail, or if you're trying to get a little grumpier, you can reach in for that flank and say, hey, quit. That says um, a little more powerful correction, but all of these things are are gradually increased as we go. Now, you, um, if you can't verbally stop and then physically handle... Uh, you, again, you're not ready. You're not ready for testing and, but stuff happens. Mistakes are going to happen. Okay. Stuff, they're dogs, but that's the category that you need to be shooting for. Okay. That's the category that you need to have accomplished so that you feel like I can run in upwards of three different locations without needing to push the button. The biggest mistake or trap that I think people fall into is they get over a line. It's a trap. 
They get over reliant on um, handling with a collar, correct, and preemptively handling their dog and yep. not letting the dog make a mistake. That's what we call nagging. Nagging with your e collar is not ideal. Dogs well, your dogs need the don't learn. Yeah, they yeah. don't learn how to do it without the nagging. Basically, it's like putting a check collar on your dog and making them point. Well, they never learn to point on their own. So, um, anyway, yeah, an interesting tidbit we got here. You never run without an e-collar. No, 100% no. And people say, well, how do you prepare for the dog not having an e-collar on? They don't know any different, right? We stop using them, and we never make a big deal of it. Like, oh, hey, buddy, I'm putting your e-collar on. Look at this. Hey, just so you know, you've got your e-collar on. You better just, listen. It just becomes part of the day, right? So if we can't holler and stop you, then you're not ready to move on to the next step. But that's what you've got to be. It moves into the category of positive punishment. There's a whole bunch of stuff about you can train dogs without corrections and whatever. I think that falls into a different category of dogs. Um, you need some form of understanding that what you did was wrong if we're going to get there in this lifetime, okay? Dogs don't live that long, unfortunately. All right. Did that answer the question? I think it answered I think the so, and I was trying to just scroll down to see if he had given any more little... Other tidbits in there? Tidbits, but... Um, Subtle movements in the feet, no forward movement. Yeah. He does not chase. He just picks up a foot ah, or ah, drops the ah, foot that ah, is ah, up ah, on point. Um, That's not going to get you in any trouble. Nope. I have uh, multiple master hunters that have happy feet, and it's nerve-wracking. It kind of gets you in this, like, uh, don't you move, you little turd. But, um, nah, it's not going to get you in trouble. They're looking for forward progress, so... If somebody got on you for that, it'd be like, man, you're having a bad day or something. But uh, forward progress, that's the ticket. What do we got next? Um, we did a lot of talking this evening, and it's And okay. we missed last week, so. Yeah, yeah, so let's get a couple questions in here. Uh, Andrew Baird said, hey, I just purchased a 509 and 505 bird launcher from your site. Standing bingo, Stowe bingo. Supply.com. Uh, do you know when you'll be having more 505s in stock? Unfortunately, not for a November. little while. November time frame is what DT System said for the next shipment of bird launchers that will be coming. So um, I know that they are hard to come by sometimes, and we have so been lucky here. enough to have them. Well, I mean, we mentioned. I did in the track. Oh, yeah. yeah. That is a bingo bango. We have a bingo, so who if if anybody I is I haven't <laughs> scrolled down to s it's hard to follow. I need I, understand. I need Charles. Charlie. Oh, this one somebody oops, bloop bloop. That's the one that's that the was one the one, one from before. That's the one we checked from before, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sorry guys, it's hard to keep track of these comments sometimes. Oh, there was a live uh super chat too that just popped up. Nice. Do, 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 do. Oh, Kelly. Maybe Kelly? That's that's the w that's the one. I think where did it go? Uh, oh, where is my bingo? <laughs> right there. A two B C D nine. Is that it? Yep. Bingo. All right. Winner winner chicken dinner. Miss Kelly, Yay, uh, Kelly, reach out to us. You know how to get a hold of us, and we'll get your info. Super chat. Roll on that Super one. Super chat. Thanks for um, playing, folks. From it's the only giveaway for this evening. A at all. Can a GSP be trained in two or more disciplines and be expected to range while hunting and not range far when undesired in other sports? Would it be fair to them to know the difference in expectations? So we utilize our dogs for different disciplines. Um, we have taught some of our dogs to uh, shed hunt as well as upland hunt. And we've also done blood trailing. And obviously, other hunting, um, waterfall hunting, upland hunting. And um, when you're waterfall hunting, the dogs obviously understand that the situation is different, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're not just in this big open field to be hunting. Now, when they're doing shed hunting and upland hunting, that is one thing that um, they're still out there hunting and they're ranging. And it was really interesting. We were out there working on sheds, and <laughs> we ran into a pheasant, and then we were no longer hunting sheds anymore. 
So um, the dog's brain kind of turned on to we are out here upland hunting now. So um, it does take a lot for a dog to be able to focus on different disciplines. And they are out there hunting, and it just depends what we're hunting for. Um, so it can definitely vary. Uh, when we're doing, like, blood trailing with deer, dog's got to be on a check cord. So that's obviously giving the dog different context clues of what we're out there doing. So um, I hope that that answered your question. Um, I would say um, to our dogs naturally adjust to cover. That's something that they learn. So different disciplines, different areas even. Um, for example, if we are, we're going to go hunt grasslands here in, uh, it's going to be short grass prairie type stuff. It's um, big rolling hills, wide open areas. The dogs run big. I mean, like really big, Okay. I don't know, to make, I don't know, 200 plus yards, maybe 300, 400. And that's not really big for some folks, but two, 300 yards is a long way, okay? You need a dog that you can trust in order to be in there. But at the same time, two, 300 yards isn't going to be as beneficial when we are hunting um, pheasants, okay? Um, it is potentially going to work with quail if you've got the right dog for it too. But it's it all comes down to the dog, your ability to trust them, but then a lot of the time the dogs are going to naturally adjust to cover. Thicker stuff's going to slow them down, wide open stuff, bigger country, that's going to open them up a little bit. And every dog also has limitations. So um, whatever their specific range that they want naturally to be in, you can work away from that, but you're going to have to fight it pretty hard. So that's where we've talked about in the past, picking the right dog for you and kind of working into that. So I think that would be a good one to follow up on with steadiness and belly collar stuff. Good. From Facebook. All right. So great, uh, great question. Super Jack category. And then I'll grab this one here. What is going on? I don't know. We don't need to see that part. Well, that's what I'm trying to get off of it. Ah. <laughs> don't mess up. There, there it is. is. Ta da. It was just. And I've got them up here okay. on this thing, too. So here's a question here from Claire on Facebook. Thank you for watching, tuning in here. It says Question about the belly collar. Do you do any prior steps before putting it on the belly, like half hitch or pulling up the belly where um, when on point? Do you ever skip the belly collar on some dogs and just use the neck collar? I'm asking because my dog is pretty naturally steady but I haven't trained steadiness with her yet and just wonder if some naturally steady dogs, you can skip some steps. I actually just started using the e-collar for reinforcing heel and training, but haven't used it one in the field. Sorry if my question is too long. Not too long at all. This is great. Um, that's an interesting next question. There's one too that it, we can grab okay. on. All right, so as far as the, the belly collar aspect of things go, that is how we teach woe training. Now, there are some basic steps as far as a half hitch and a post and all of those kind of things that kind of help a dog to get more used to belly pressure. But on average, the way that we do it would be put the belly collar on. Um, and if this is going to help for if you have any understanding of horses, but when you do the strap that would go around the horse's belly or even their chest, any of the strapping goes, they'll puff out and take in air, and then you'll have to cinch them down. So start with your belly collar not being super, super tight. Put it on a little bit, just barely snug, and that's going to be easier for the dog to adjust to. Take them for just a normal run. Don't do anything else with it, Never, not applying stimulation or doing anything that way. And then once they get through that run, you're going to, as you go along, click it up another hole or two or three, move through that point where they're getting used to running and moving with it on and it shouldn't be that big of a deal. And then follow along. We've got a few different videos, including one that says the five steps of woe training slash six steps of woe training, where we show how we take thunder from not understanding woe basically to completely call it understanding verbally woe, which is how we teach puppies. We have videos on that as well. But then um uh, the collar conditioning portion and how that works through. We utilize a belly collar for collar conditioning to well because of the fact that we put so much emphasis on everything being with, you know, a response to pressure on the dog's neck that woe is kind of a not natural thing for dogs to do, except for in the presence of birds, bird dogs specifically stopping and standing still is not normal. Okay. So 
when you are applying pressure here, if there's a, any lack of understanding, they're going to try and come to you. They're going to try and go someplace. They're going to try and move, which is all we've done thus far, or sit or lay down. Anything else that we potentially have collar conditioned, okay? Belly pressure says one thing. That's stop, stand still. It's also their natural response to move away from the stimulation, which is this kind of movement, and then they can't s- they, they because don't want to stretch out. Tense yep. up a little bit. Yep. yep. So like a tens unit tightens your muscles down. That's what's happening there. They say, oh, okay, move away from the pressure, stand up, stand there. It's super, super easy. Even dogs that are naturally steady, we wouldn't typically skip this step. So no, and great skipping question. skipping steps just typically uh, leaves creates holes. yeah leaves holes, creates problems down the road, um, adds some confusion to the situation. So we got a super chat from Mason Leslie. Uh, thank you for the super chat. I know y'all are bird dog people, but I've watched y'all's channel religiously in preparation for my red bone puppy. Will obedience training vary from bird dog to coon dog? Not planning on hunting him. So that's a really great question. Congrats on your puppy. Um, and thanks for watching our content. So definitely you can utilize all of the basic obedience stuff with your puppy. Um, all of the things that we talk about with socialization and house manners and place training and color conditioning, uh, starting that clicker training process with, you know, quicker recall, clicker place training, um, teaching them to sit, all of that can be applied. And then if you need additional help or you're struggling with your puppy following along specifically with, you know, some of the videos we've put out, you can reach out to us on Patreon and we'd be happy to help guide you through that process. What a dork. Did you see him? Vex? Like hanging his head over the edge of his chair. It's... Yeah, he is the strangest sleeping dog ever. I have a hilarious reel that I have a draft of that will be going out shortly of him. <laughs> Another hilarious reel of him sleeping because mm-hmm. he has a million of those. You said you had one. Did you say you I had do. one Let's on Let's grab one more from Facebook and one more from YouTube unless there's a super chat that bops in. But Oh, gosh. Yeah, just see. grab one okay. more from each. I don't want to let people have their evenings. It says here from Jeremy Reynolds, and there's a big uh, push in this category of questions tonight, but it's a good one. It says, what's the best way in master hunt test to have the dog bring the bird back to the handler, not the person that shot the bird? Okay. So first and foremost, if the gunner is doing what they're supposed to, they should be turning their back to the dog and you should be about the only person faced and looking in the direction of the dog returning, as well as dogs are pretty keen on who you are. I mean, they really are. It's um, Now, if everybody's wearing the exact same clothes, it can be a little harder, but they're pretty keyed in on who you are, even to the extent of I will gun for some of my more finished dogs, Vex being one specifically. I'm like, hey, somebody else can handle him. He's going to mostly be, it's mostly an auto drive type of situation, but kind of gives you a little bit of a feel for what it's like to be handling a finished dog. And I'll gun, and I'll stand with my back turned, and he'll pop over and stop right next to me. Like, he knows who, where daddy's at. That's it. Um, Kelly said, did you do the counter surfing chicken test yet? No, because she's in heat. And she's staying in the kennel until that mess is over with. After she is done bleeding like a murder scene everywhere, we will do the chicken test. I will win. If anybody remembers. I will win. I will win. I will win. All right. Pick a question there on the the old YouTubers. Pick a good one. There are a lot of good ones. Okay, hold on. Don't pick a bad one. (laughs) No pressure. I'll pick a baby one for you. In regards to the belly color, do you use vibrate or, sti- or spike stimulation? Um, we use stimulation. Uh, vibrate in that position isn't going to really help us. So, Stim, baby. Someone asked, and this is just a quick Kay. one. They, um, I can't remember who, and I'm just scrolling through trying to find it again. They were asking, um, should they try running their puppy through the natural ability eye test, test or just running them through NAVDA if it's their first dog, or should they wait for them to become more experienced um, with a, a dog in the future? No, absolutely. Get involved now. You're going to learn a lot. Um, Even if you make some mistakes, you're going to learn from those mistakes. So don't be afraid to get involved and work with your dog and prepare them and take them and test them. All right, grab a real one. I know, I know, I know, I know.
Facebook's done a pretty good job with the old closed captioning here. They're, they've got everything rolling on there. Everything we say pops up on the screen. So this is one that relates to um, right, what we were talking question, about with folks. the the Navda testing. So Pacman from Packmaster Gun Dogs. Hey oh. If the dog breaks and you woe it, is the judgment for steadiness for that particular bird over, or can the dog still receive scoring for the subsequent steadiness portions? Very good question. Good question. Um, so the question is if the dog because like we talked about, the steadiness is broken down into different portions. We've got steady to flush, steady to wing, steady to shot, steady to fall. Let's say your dog was steady through flush, steady to wing, but in the steady to shot portion, they tried to break because the gunfire happened, the bird was going down, they got excited, and you yelled, whoa, at them, and they went, oh, stopped in their tracks. Then the bird hit the ground, no movement, you sent the dog for the retrieve. You can absolutely still be scored for that steady to fall portion. Um, you, uh, because you handled that dog in the steady to shot portion, your score is going to be affected uh, now. I'm not going to put scores on anything as just the explanation of the sequence happening without Guess actually what? I'll seeing I'll put scores it. on it. I'm not a judge, okay? So in the beginning, you're going in. This is the steady to flush portion, right? So you've got the, the – you're kicking around. Dog doesn't move. Wah, wah, wah. Here comes the bird out. Okay, so in that portion in the beginning, the dog doesn't move. They're going to receive all of the points for it because they didn't move, Okay. Then the bird is flying, and it's got to be a pheasant, so they go, <laughs> it's flying away, right? Dog doesn't move, gets the maximum points in that steadiness category. Then the shot goes off, kaboom, Navda gunners are the best, they don't miss, bird is hit right there, there's no movement again, and the bird is falling, and there's zero movement at all by the dog, and the bird hits the ground. So in the steady to shot portion, Dog's going to get the maximum points. And then the bird hits the ground. Dog still doesn't move. Handler then says, fetch him up, Clyde, or whatever they say, right? And so they were they were steady until they were sent. So they're going to get the maximum points in all of the steadiness categories because they didn't move. But f per the question, right? So dog stands there till the birds in the air stands there kaboom you shoot which is this is where the biggest mistakes are going to happen for most dogs they try and take off or make some big hops and you yell whoa Clyde and so then you you're going to lose a lot of points in that steady to shot category but then at the end if they don't move until you come over and send them they're going to get the the maximum points there and then you average that stuff out essentially correct now, if every single bird, let's say they find four or five birds, and they have the same problem on every single bird, that's going to affect their overall picture of what happened. If they have a little hiccup in the beginning, a little hiccup at the end, a little hiccup in the middle, but it's all pretty dang good, it's going to bode better for the day. Correct. Boom. See? We had one final super chat before we got roll. to go. From RT... Do you deal with dog fights? If so, how? Dog fights happen. People, their dogs are unpredictable animals. Things happen. Um, mm -hmm. And the level of fight depends on the dog. Um, our best advice is to prevent dog fights. Ounce of prevention, pound of cure. Yeah, which is important um, to read your dog. Make sure that they understand what appropriate interactions with other dogs are, what appropriate play is, and then watch when they're interacting with other dogs. Are the dogs that they are interacting with uncomfortable with their interactions? Are they stiff? Are their ears pinned? Um, we need to be able to anticipate that those dogs are going to escalate that and step in and disrupt that and interrupt that before it escalates into a full-blown fight. Now, if fight is actually going on, don't put your hand in there, guys. No. Nah. Don't put your hand in there. No, no, you'd um, be collateral damage. Yeah, and um, but getting the dogs apart is is important, um, and just doing it without getting hurt. Yeah, and I mean, really, there's there's no good way to to break up a dog fight. It's tough. Yeah, and l it's tough, especially because you every dog is different, and they're gonna have different reactions. You know, some dogs have a fight 
Some dogs have a flight. Some dogs have a flight until they have to fight. It just depends. And um, interacting with that so that you don't get hurt um, is really important and to minimize the damage that the, that the dogs do to each other. So, Great question. Um, the last that I'm going to say before we sign off here, because this one's fun, it says, what is the best way? And he's asked it like a hundred times. Yeah, what is the best way to convince my parents to get a GSP? I'm going to tell you right now, big dog, that you should just be um, guy, gal, Gabe, I, I'm guessing. Um, right write yourself a report okay put all of the information and in why you want why you should the research that cons. you've done pros and cons and then uh, that's you get that's gonna be your best bet I mean it's show you're putting in the effort put a proposal together it's a it's a proposal 100%. I totally did that when I was growing up things that I wanted whether that was a CD player goodness I'm dating myself um, or, or whatever, You're old. Oh, I'm so old or whatever I wanted, but, um, I put together a proposal about why I should get one, what, um, research I've done, uh, if it was an animal, because our first dog we did this with, we put together a proposal to get our first dog, which was from the Humane Society and, you know, what our plan was to take care of this dog and not just make it uh, my parents' responsibility. So, 100%. Um, yeah, put together a proposal, do your research, show them that you're a responsible person that would be involved in the upbringing of this GSP and that you would contribute. Absolutely. Uh, folks, we love you. We enjoy spending time with you in the evenings, answering questions and chit-chatting about bird dogs. I'm Kat the Dog Trainer. I'm the guy with the pink gun. Until next time, we will see you.